Hello and welcome to the Academy of Powerful Caregivers presented by Kevin Shorter. This is Module 1, The Motivation of a Caregiver. Today's lesson is How to Have Empathy Without Losing Hope. Hello and welcome back to the Academy of Powerful Caregivers. I'm Kevin Shorter and I'm looking forward to today's lesson on how to have empathy without losing hope. Um, You are a a powerful caregiver because you have the power within you to instill life into other people. And so I'm really excited to be um, facilitating this discussion, knowing that as I continue to instill hope in you, you're instilling hope into other people. And it's a a wonderful honor to be a part of this for you. And uh, today, we uh, last time we looked at how to trust in the goodness of man. And the main, main idea is that Jesus didn't come to put good in us and take um, because there's no goodness in there, but he did remove the evil and the bad that was in there so that the goodness that was placed in us from the very beginning may be able to come out and be seen by the world around us. Uh, so when, Jesus, when God said that he created us in the likeness of him, uh, of him, that he actually took the, the image of God and placed it within us, and there's a goodness and his glory and his goodness within us. And so when we fall short, when we, when we sin and fall short of the glory of God, we're actually fall shorting, we're falling short of that goodness that he's placed in us that we are meant to call out all the way from the very beginning when we were born. We were called to bring that into this world, to bring more and more of his goodness into the world. And so there's goodness in the people we're dealing with, and we're so excited that as we, we deal with other people, we could actually connect with that goodness and connect with what God has put in there and actually get it, see it come to life in their lives and releasing more of God's glory in the world around us. And so that's kind of uh, from last lesson. This lesson, we're going to look at how to have empathy without losing hope. Uh, because the thing is, if you don't believe in the goodness of God, and we talked about this two weeks ago, two times ago, if you don't believe in the goodness of God, then you're going to give up because really what hope is there? And if you don't believe in the goodness of man, then you're always trying to talk them out of who they are. Because if there's no goodness in there to begin with, then you have to basically tell them, you need to become someone new. In reality, what you're doing is you're trying to release what's really in there. So you need to become who you really were meant to be. Um, we might be dealing with people that a family uh, a family member has cancer. And in that situation, it just looks like there is no hope. Um, you might be dealing with someone who um, had been gang raped. Um, there was a... You know, that's, that's a real possibility in, in these days. And there's, what kind of hope is there in that? Um, and then there's other scenarios. Maybe a, sp- someone, a, a guy finds out his wife is pregnant, but with someone else's child. Um, there's just so many things that go on in this world that you can just lose hope on. And so what we want to look at is how do you, how do you maintain hope when we see, the, see all these bad things happen? Um, how do we... You know, we, we do hold on to the, the goodness of God. We do hold on to the goodness of man. But the things of this world really challenges us to, are we really going to believe that? So what we want to do is, uh, as caregivers, we, we want to uh, walk into the world of people's hurt. We want to step into their lives in a way that, that when we bring hope, we're bringing hope to them as well. So first story I want to look at is... Um, Job. We all know the story of Job. He loses his um, his kids and some freak accident where uh, I think the barn fell down or something like that. But they, you know, the roof fell on top of all of his kids, and and so he loses them. He uh, his health goes really bad. Um, he starts getting these shingles. It hurts really bad. He lost all of his wealth. I think that probably happened before. Um, just everything was going bad. His wife tells him, just curse God and forget this world. Um, it just It's not worth it anymore. So everyone was turning against him. And then he had three friends come, traveled. And, and they first thing they do is they, they sit down with Job. And like for seven days, all they do is weep. And really, it's a, it's a great start when we're dealing with people in pain. is is not to offer solutions so quickly that we, uh, we don't actually identify with what they're hurting with. And how they're feeling, and so they did start off well, but then they they got in this the the Job's friends got in this almost like a fear mode, like you know 
Job, look out, you know, if you continue down this path and, and uh, you know, something's, something's obviously, all this stuff is going wrong, so you must have done something to tick God off or um, brought this upon yourself because, you know, you know, we can't blame God for this. And, and really, that just leaves you, Job. And so, um, in their kind of idea of defending God, uh, they attack Job. And, uh, and obviously, at the very end, God does reprimand the, uh, these friends and say, you know, allow them to know that they, they did not give good advice. Um, but think about, you know, as we look into helping other people, we should uh, be careful not to move so quickly in our help of other people that we actually do more harm than good. Um, and trying to offer advice or help that's really um, not addressing the real need. So the next story I want to look at is, is a story of two women. There was two women who both had babies, young babies, and um, they were caring for them and kind of next to each other in the same same area and closed space. And um, during the night, one of the women rolled over on her baby and suffocated, and, and the baby died. And she woke up just out of fear because her her knowing that her child had died and uh, not knowing what to do. And uh, she saw the other the other mother and her child and their children about the same age, and she switched the babies so that um, this other woman had the dead child. And so they kind of played it off, and then in the morning, the, the other mother woke up and realized that the baby that was next to her was dead. And she, in the midst of her freaking out, she realized that it wasn't her baby at all. It was, it was another, another woman's baby. Now, most of you already know the story, and you know what's going on. And, and, uh, but try to, try to picture how everyone was feeling in the midst of this. You have the obviously the mother who who had her baby switched. The anger and the frustration and the, and the fear in the midst of it. it's like someone's trying to steal my my child, and um, and now I have someone else's child and and I want my child back. And there's that that injustice in that in the midst of that. But also think about the other woman and she the the fact her her child died. Um, I mean. F- Obviously, switching the babies is wrong, and, and that's a really hard um, situation. But the fact that her child had died was a very fluke accident. Um, I mean, it is common, but I'm saying it wasn't like she meant to roll over on her baby. It wasn't like, um, you know, she did something very, uh, that was uncommon in her day, and, uh, and uh, like sleeping with her child. And so the fear that came over her is like, I just lost something precious to me. And now I'm going to try to find a way to recapture that. And she did that. So I'm not trying to justify what she had done, but can you imagine the pain that she was going through? So you, you get her coming before the king. The king is going to make a decision about, or the kind of the sit in as a judge. And what's, what are we going to do for these two women? And the, the king was Solomon. And Solomon made this decision saying, the, the child that's left alive, needs to be split in half. I mean, we can't decide which, which mother is the real mother. We, we don't know, so we're just going to split the child in half, and both of you will get a piece of that child. And then the real mother obviously says, I'd rather that baby go to the other woman and, and still be alive. Or the, the, the mother who switched the baby said, fine, that's fine, we'll just do that. And so Solomon knows, like, all right, we know who the mother is. The mother is the one who wanted the child to live, even if it couldn't be with her. And so we look at that situation, and it's like, wow, that's uh, we've all heard the story now. So, and and to some extent, maybe some of you haven't, but most of you have heard the story and think, and kind of used to it. But if you think about the, uh, in that situation, if you were sitting in, and tr- trying to figure out which which child, which mother gets the child, you have to realize that uh, Solomon has supernatural wisdom. And that was one of the things he asked for, and we, we learn it from reading other parts of the Bible. But if we want to have an accurate uh, view of how to help other people, we have to give room for God's supernatural in, in, intervention, for him to come in and say, what are we going to do in the situation? How are we going to we, like, ha- have him show us what, what's the best way to offer help and offer life? So the major difference really between Solomon 
and Job's friend isn't the fact that the willingness to help. Job's friend really wanted to help. You see them crying and trying to and just console Job. But then they tried to offer help from their human wisdom, where Job, where Solomon allowed God to intervene and God to come in and bring, give his wisdom. And then it was offer um, true help and true life. So when we move toward people entering into our pain, we have to give room for God's intervention, God's goodness to shine forth by allowing him to speak. If all we do is focus on the problems, the best advice we really can give is help them to um, deal with their problems, help them to kind of live with them and live with the, uh, the ramifications of their problems. But if we give room for the God to focus on him and listen to him, then we can actually offer supernatural health. When Jesus, after he had been resurrected, after he died, resurrected, and left, uh, Peter and James were walking through Jerusalem. And they came upon a man begging because he had been uh, paralyzed. And so he's begging them for money. And uh, it's as they were walking in, they, they Peter and John acknowledge him. And, then, and Peter goes, you know, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I do have. And he says, in Jesus' name, stand up and walk. And so, in the midst of that, they, they saw what he was wanting. He was wanting money. But Peter and James saw what God wanted to do, and that was given the ability to walk. Now, some of you might not be comfortable with uh, you know, praying for healing or bringing healing on other people. And, uh, but we see that's what Peter and John does here. But you, you do have something to offer. Each of us has something to give to the, the people that we're working with, the those that we want to give care to. And if we don't feel like we have anything to give, then it's we're gonna be we're gonna run out of um, we'll run out of hope really quick. But when we have something to give people, we have something that's gonna bring them life, something they need, then we know what it is and that we can offer to them freely, knowing that what we have is something that they need. So what I'm gonna look at next is is uh, if, passage where Paul talks about how he gave freely to others and how he was able to do that in a way that, and not lose hope. So it's going to start in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Now stop. Paul immediately declares do not lose heart. And the point of this and why I wanted to read that first and stop there is that the idea is that there is a tendency to lose heart. There is a tendency to give up hope. And that's what we want to focus in on here in this, in this lesson is how do, we, how do we have empathy? How do we move towards people and enter in their pains and not lose hope? How do we continue to move forward? And um, so Paul's saying that if we don't keep this in check, we will. We will lose hope. And so he starts off with this, this chapter that we do not lose hope. Do not lose hope. So it goes on in um, verse, chapter 4, talking about the gospel. But one would jump down to verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. So we look at the pressures of this world that cause us to be hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, but we are not crushed, we're not in despair, not abandoned, and not destroyed, because we carry within us the resurrection, resurrected life of Jesus. We experience these pains, these struggles in this world for the sake of Christ, for the sake of allowing his life to be revealed in us. It's, the, it's like those pressures put to death our mortal body, put to death our kind of the thoughts, our, our trust in our own ability, and pushes us towards the trust in the Holy Spirit, trust in the risen power of Christ within us, trust that 
He is going to provide something when we cannot. We come to the end of ourselves so we may know that it is not by our own strength that this happens, but by Christ working within us. And so when we we get to these places of really stretching too thin and st- becoming really uh, incapable of doing the work ourselves. We, we re- go back into the presence of God. We trust in His goodness again. We, we come back into it so that we have His power to be released within us. And that's when those around us are also starting to see life come in, in their lives, but also they see what's going on in us and knows that it has to be God. And so that's where our life is. And so when we see those struggles and see the pain, we do not get dismayed. We do not get discouraged because we know that his life is going to ease on, uh, eke on out of us. It's going to come through the cracks and we're going to have life to give. So we don't let the pain consume us. We don't let it uh, overwhelm us. And actually we'll look more at that as we continue on verse 13. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. And again, he puts it there. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Therefore, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we see that we're not dying for dying's sake, but we're we're being renewed daily and allowing his, His presence to come within us. And to renew our mind and renew our lives and renew our heart and our strength. And the idea is we do not look at the scene. What we, you know, that it, the stuff, the circumstances of life, we don't allow that to be our focus. We look on what is unseen. We look at God in the midst of all of this. And so that we can keep our faith in him and we know his truth. And so some of the ways we do this is we, we actually go back to the, the promises of the Bible. And we say, this is what God says in the midst of this. We know that he is good. In all things, God is good and works for the glory of, well, good for those who are called by his name. We know that I am more than a conqueror. I, I know that I, with, I have God in me and I always have hope. Because uh, it says that without God, it was when I was without hope. Now that I have God, I have hope. So we go back to these, these situations and say, you know, if God not only died for us, he died on the cross for my sins, if he was willing to do all this, what else would, what would stop him from continuing to love me? What would stop him from coming to help me right now? What would stop his love from reaching out and ministering to these people that he wants to, to reach out to? He wants them to experience him. So I can have I can have heart and encouragement that that when I speak into other people's lives, I know that God wants to enter in and He wants to be connect with them. So I have faith and I have hope in every situation. So I do not lose heart, and that's what Paul is trying to get out here. We we don't look at uh, our circumstances. Our circumstances are always going to try to tell us, you know what, God's not going to come through this time. But we look at God and say, no, I know the truth, and I know that he's going to come through. Now starting in chapter 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So when we look at even here, that all of these deaths, all of these things that go on in our life, are actually working to something deeper within us. They're, They're 
creating a longing in us that we don't want to be satisfied with this earthly dwelling anymore. We are looking for that heavenly, heavenly dwelling where we're clothed in God. We're clothed in His righteousness. And that's why He said He sent a Spirit guaranteeing us of the things that are to come. So we are, we are actually, through His Spirit, are, are experiencing what is going to come in, in heaven. So we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to experience everything. We have the Holy Spirit now to experience it here to show us what it's going to be like, to actually create a longing with us for even more of heaven here. You know, so when Jesus tells us when we're to pray, to sort of pray on earth as is in heaven, we're supposed to experience as much heaven as here as we can to actually create a place where other people see what heaven is like, see God in His glory and His goodness, that they want to come to Him as well. Now let's continue down in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So why do we put ourselves through all of this? Why do we put ourselves through all this death and all this you know, little things that are like being struck down, persecuted, pressed in on every side? Why do we put ourselves in these situations? It's because the love of Christ compels us we are ministers, ambassadors of reconciliation. We are bringing God's reward to him, the, the desires of his heart, the nations to him, by releasing life in other people. We are, we're, taking, we're entering into the evils of their lives. Even we're, This is not just looking, okay, we're looking for non-Christians to become Christians. We're looking at Christians who have, have a separation of experiencing all of God has for them because of some, the evils in this world. And some of that is just natural uh, disease or sickness, what we consider on this earth natural disease and sickness. And so we are bringing in life and hope, and even in those situations, and, and say even the most tragic of situations, where someone like a, someone, a wife or a husband cheated on their spouse and, and creates such pain and, and hurt and, and distrust, we can enter into those situations and bring God in the midst of it. And somehow, in His goodness and His grace, He can bring life into that situation and allow them to start seeing hope for themselves and hope for their situation. It's not saying that they have to get back in reconciliation with their spouse. And all it does is saying, God is going to enter in and He's going to do something in such a way that their life is going to change and their life is going to never be the same. And they're going to be encouraged because we entered in. And so we don't have the answer because there isn't a, a definite answer for the situation. Okay, well, yes, your spouse cheated on you. Did they, um, did they have a child with the other person? Then you must do this. Did they, are they repentant? Then you must do this. Um, did they seem repentant but not? Well, then you want to take these. There's no definite answer for their situation. Um, but... God can come in and hear their heart, hear their pain, and give them a way out. Uh, a way out of their pain where they can have hope in their situation and know the right thing. The, not just the right thing to do, but know the way that's going to bring life back into them. And see, what happens is we get people we're dealing with are experiencing the evils of this world. And again, it's some, you know, some of you are just teachers and all you're really doing, you think you're, all you're really doing is offering education. Say, I'm a math teacher by background, I, I, in the sense of that was my college undergrad degree, was math education. So you can get, say, okay, all I'm doing is teaching 
these kids how to do algebra. Where is the the real scenario of life and, and, and death in this situation? We have kids coming in, they 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 think that they're they're bad at math, they can't do math, or, or the worst is when it's like I'm a you know, I'm a girl, I can't do math. Who says girls can't do math? But whatever, it's the idea is you're as a teacher coming in, you're giving them no. In Christ, you can do anything. With God, nothing is impossible. There's no situation that has no solution. You have the ability to do everything that's put before you because you have God in you. And you can go into any person and say, no, I know that my God has given you a brain and has given you resources to understand immensely immense things. And there's people out there who know like 12 different languages. For me, that seems impossible, but that's a human mind is, a, is amazing. So someone who says they can't do algebra, that's ridiculous. They might have had bad teachers in the past. They might have not studied well. They might have not done, but the fact is they can do it. And uh, so we, we want to give, and I'm not trying to say it's not hard, but that it can be done. We want to give hope in every situation. So the thing, someone might have, okay, something that seems more permanent, say someone who can't walk. Well, that was a situation that Peter and James were in. That person couldn't walk from life. They could not walk. And he brought hope in the situation. No, no, in Jesus' name, stand up and walk. And now, I'm not saying that you should go up to every person who's who's can't walk and, and start saying, get up and walk. But you want to listen to what God is doing in the situation. And, and uh, sometimes stepping out of faith is doing those really hard things. And for you, the faith might just be going to someone and say, you know what, I don't know what to say in this situation. Your your spouse just died. And it scares me because I don't know what to say because I know if that happened to me, I would just be just beside myself. But you do have God and you do have hope. So you enter in. It's like, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. And some of you, that's the biggest step of faith you can take and I tell you every time that will be right is when you step in and say you know what I don't know what to offer you but I'm going to step in and offer anyhow because you're worth it you're valuable and you're loved by God and because you, he loves you I'm going to love you too and I'm going to step into the situation and offer what I do have and maybe as I go maybe God will show me what to give Maybe I just need to step out of the boat to see if I can walk on water. Maybe I need to put my foot in the river to see if it will part. Sometimes you just need to take that first step of action. And I sometimes that's what I'm saying. Maybe for you, just going into the person who's hurting and saying, you know what, I don't know what to give you, but I'm coming anyhow. In reality, if if we thought we're the ones bringing all the, all the help to the person, if we're the only ones giving care, and giving the help to the people we're dealing with, then we will lose hope. Because we will come to the end of ourselves, and we will realize that apart from God in our lives, we don't have enough. Uh, we might give some good stuff. We might be able to put our arm around them. We might be able to, but eventually it's going to wear very thin when we realize that apart from God, we, we cannot change anyone. But the fact we do have God, we do have life, and and it, and we realize it's not about us, then we don't have to we don't have to perform. We don't have to have the right words. We don't have to see someone's life changed just by stepping into the situation and say, "I'm coming." That's faith, and God rewards faith. You know, it says it's impossible to please God without faith. I think it's impossible not to please God if you have faith, and it's the same idea. And He rewards those who come. Is he rewards those who trust him, and so for us, it, our our des- way to continue to press in and not lose hope in the midst of people when we enter in their pain is to realize it's not about us. We can just step in and offer what we have, and knowing that it might not see this drastic change, but it's offering hope because it's p- impossible for you to step into someone's life 
and not bring hope because you have God with you. And so I just bless you and I just thank you for being a part of this lesson today. And we look forward to um, many more lessons in this, in this module. Uh, remember, there are questions in the book. If you, if you have the book, there's some questions that help you to dig deeper. And always use your journal. Use something to write down the things that God is teaching you. Because as we go through these lessons, we move from one point to another. It's really easy to forget those things that God has pressed in your heart at an earlier lesson. But if you write them down now while there's fresh on your mind, then it's, it's going to have a, a greater likelihood for it to seep in. And, and, and I know if God is speaking to you, you want to remember that. So we just thank you for your time, and uh, we look forward to the next lesson. We hope you enjoyed this lesson from Kevin Shorter on the Academy of Powerful Caregivers. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to apc at josiahscovenant.com. Be sure to check out the next lesson on how to love others.